Hey there, my name is Nicholas Flatoff. I'm a technical brand ambassador for Savda Coffee. We're here at our Portland showroom to demonstrate an uncrate and assembly for a Savda standard lift or distoner lift system. In order to perform an uncrate and assembly, you're going to need some tools. At a bare minimum, you're going to need a ratchet with a 13 millimeter and 7 millimeter socket. You're also going to need a 13 millimeter open-ended box end or adjustable wrench like this. And you're going to need a 3 millimeter and 4 millimeter Allen key. In order to remove the lid from the crate, you're going to need a number two Phillips and either an electric screwdriver or an impact wrench. In addition, you might find it beneficial to have a ratcheting screwdriver with your three millimeter and four millimeter Allen bits and a razor blade. However, they're not necessary to perform the install. Okay, let's crack this thing open. The first step is a fun one. You're going to start by just pulling all the Phillips head screws off of the top of the crate so that you can remove the crate lid, and I'll show you how to do it. Once you've removed all the screws, go ahead and collect them off the crate lid, and then you're able to remove the lid of the crate. Next step, we're just going to remove the lid and go over some of the contents of the crate. On our left side here, we have our cyclone with some vacuum hose. We have a sight glass. We have a control box. We have some tri-clamp pieces and some miscellaneous fittings and the hopper itself. Uh, the first thing that you want to do when you remove the crate lid, um, this is very important, um, is go ahead and photo document the edges of the crates so that you're able to have a record if some damage is found from shipping later on. That way we've got the state of the crate as it was when you removed the, uh, the lid of the crate. Now that you have the top off the crate, you can start removing equipment and laying it out in a nice orderly fashion. It's very important that you get photo documentation of the contents of the crate as soon after receipt as possible. The reason is we only have five days to file an insurance claim if there is some damage associated with shipping. We recommend that you do this in a nice wide open space, which is going to make inventorying the entire crate much easier. Now that you have all of the equipment laid out in an orderly fashion, it's going to be super easy to do inventory. We email all of our packing lists out to our clients, so look out for an email from your technical ambassador going over what's in your crate. I'm not going to go over every piece of equipment that we have here, but I'm going to go over some of the main ones that you want to make sure are in the crate. We have the vacuum hose for the lift system. We have a control box and both the wiring and control wiring for that control box. We have some distoner parts and pieces for the conveyance system. We have the hopper, and we have the cyclone. Those are going to be the major parts that come in that crate. And what you want to do is go through and just check off on that order list everything that you've received, and notify your technical ambassador uh, as soon as possible if there is something missing from that order or damaged. Now that you've completed your packing list and ensured that everything is here and without damage, uh, it's time to actually go ahead and start assembling. Um, I like to take this moment to just make sure I've got a nice clean workspace. You'll notice here uh, where we have our staging area is not actually the same spot that we're doing our installation. Um, I like to do that because we've got all of our items laid out really nice and uniformly and they're not going to be in the way when we're trying to do the install. If you are doing the install uh, in the same space where you've staged your materials, just make sure that you have enough space around the equipment that you're installing uh, the lift onto, uh, that none of this stuff is getting in your way, and you're able to efficiently and effectively do the installation. So my favorite part to start with is the cyclone, and we're just going to grab this and move it over to our installation location. Now that we're at the install location, I'm going to take you through some of the steps that I'm going to do, and then I'm going to show you how to do it. The first thing we're going to do is take the saran wrap off of the cyclone. Um, the next thing, we're going to bring it up and mount it on top of, in this case, a precision fill. 
Now, this same mounting bracket can be used for all Savda products, be it the Pearl Mini or the Precision Fill. You may have a custom mounting bracket for a coffee roaster or another weigh-in fill device uh, or a storage system. Um, and the steps are gonna be very similar for you, just mounting, ma matching up those holes onto the mounting surface of whatever equipment you're, you're going to install that cyclone onto. So let's get started. Now that we've removed the protective wrapping, we're able to move this onto the equipment that we're gonna install this onto. Now, I do recommend having two people. This can be a little bit heavy and a little bit bulky, um, and having two ladders on each side uh, really does help support it and get it up there. However, it is possible to do it solo. One of the things that I like to do if I'm installing this by myself is go ahead and just remove our very large tri-clamp. the top of the cyclone itself, and the filter plate that's inside. That just saves you 15 pounds or so, um, makes it a little bit easier to get it up there. You'll notice here I have the cords all inside. There's nothing dangly um, that could get caught on something while I'm climbing up the ladder. It's all nice and clean. And you can line it up with the mounting holes and the screws, and it's in position. Now that we have the equipment up on top of the machine, we're going to orient this control box here. This is the butterfly actuation valve uh, control area. Um, there's a solenoid in there that tells uh, the butterfly valve when to be pressurized and drop the coffee. Um, we want this to be generally on the back of the machine, but more importantly, close to your airline. Um, our airline right over here is also uh, near the back of the machine. So what I'm just gonna do is rotate this around to get the orientation correct. And what I'm making sure is that none of these tips go inside here. Uh, it is possible for it to fall in. It's not gonna hurt anything. You could uh, maybe scratch the equipment, um, but it's just a little bit of a pain to get out. Uh, so if you just make sure that um, none of the tips are going inside of that chamber area, you're gonna be able to ensure that it doesn't fall inside when you're rotating it around. Now that we have those lined up, we're able to take the included hardware and run it into place. Now that you have that bolt in, you can go ahead and do the seven others that you need to attach the mounting plate to your equipment. One thing to note when you're doing this top installation, I do prefer to use hand tools over power tools. That way you're less likely to damage the mounting plate, the equipment that you're attaching the mounting plate to, or the hardware itself. Now that you have your mounting plate bolted in place, you're able to go ahead and attach the top of the cyclone. We're gonna go ahead and get our cord out of here, being careful not to scratch anything as we drop that. And we're going to position the top of the cyclone as so. This right here is where your vacuum is going to attach. So go ahead and orient that towards your planned vacuum install location. In our case, that is behind the machine. Once you have that oriented, make sure that you're lining it up so it's nice and flush. That's gonna make putting our V-band or massive tri-clamp on just a little bit easier. For the final attachment, you're gonna loosen this wing nut just enough that you can slide it on and then tighten it just until you can see that our gasket in the middle is being squeezed a little bit. It's more of a tactile thing. You'll be able to feel it bulging uh, when you run your finger by. This doesn't need to be particularly tight. The way it exerts pressure is uh, pretty significant with just a little bit of tension on, uh, on this uh, clamp. So really no need to over tighten it at all. 
Okay, now that you got this bolted down and you have the top of the cyclone on, uh, you're able to go ahead and attach your airline. We use um, some pretty easy to work with 16 millimeter quick release shark bite attachments. Um, so you're able to actually just take that tube and plug it in. Now that we have that cyclone mounted on the top of our precision fill, we're able to go and get its other half, the hopper, and put that in its final install location. I'm gonna go ahead and pull off this plastic wrapping before I move it, uh, and then uh, just place it basically wherever I wanna load coffee from. Now that we have our hopper in its loading location, which in this case is gonna be the outlet shaft of our Pearl Mini, um, we see that we have a problem. Right here, this outlet is below actually the height of our hopper. So what we're gonna need to do is adjust the legs on the hopper, and I'll show you how to do that. In order to adjust the legs, it's pretty simple. I like to go ahead and just tilt the hopper backwards and lay it on its face. You're unlikely to scratch anything doing this, but if you are concerned, you could put a blanket down. We're gonna grab our 13 millimeter socket um, and the 13 millimeter box end or adjustable wrench. And we're just gonna go ahead and remove all of the uh, hardware on the legs. Now that you have the hardware removed from the leg, the leg will actually come free. But what you wanna do is go ahead and shift the holes just the number that you need. In this case, we're going to go to its lowest setting. Now you'll notice that I've chosen to use a different set of holes than the original set of holes. Which holes you put them into doesn't matter just so long as it's spread out across. The reason that we can't use these bottom two holes is because the threaded part for this foot actually runs up past the point where we could get hardware through there. So in a case where we've got four empty holes in between, that is gonna provide plenty of structural support for us, especially with the amount of coffee that's going into this hopper. Um, each leg only needs to hold about 25 pounds. So uh, it's a fairly uh, low amount of pressure and moving that hardware up a little bit is not something to be concerned about. Now that you have your hopper legs adjusted uh, with clearance between the outlet spout um, and the hopper itself, you wanna have a little wiggle room. That's gonna make sense later uh, when we actually adjust the feet. Uh, you do want a little bit of extra space um, in order to make sure that the, uh, all, all the tri-clamp and the distoner and all that is, is meshing really nice. Um, this next step is gonna be the attachment of the distoner portion of the lift. If you do not have a distoner lift, what you're gonna be able to do is just skip the section and go right to the tri-clamp tubing installation. It's gonna be identical for a distoner lift and a standard lift. This is your distoner. Um, some of them might be slightly larger or slightly smaller, might have a sight glass, might not, uh, but in general, uh, they're all gonna be the same and the mounting system down here is gonna be identical between all of them. What I like to do for a distoner installation is go ahead, <laughs> Grab your hopper, and this time tilt it the opposite way um, from the previous time, so that you've got a really nice, easy access uh, to these bolt holes here. I also like to go ahead and just loosen our friction nuts here. Slide that up, that gets your uh, distoner gate out of the way just a little bit more, makes installation easier. Next thing, go ahead and remove all of the hardware. Make sure you don't lose any of it. A magnetic tray can be uh, beneficial when you're doing this, um, although it won't stick to the silo, excuse me, the hopper itself because the hopper is not magnetic. Okay, now that you've removed all the hardware, I like to just take one, just the nut and bolt, forgetting about the washers and everything, um, just for slightly easier install. And just get one of the holes lined up. 
for me, this makes it a little bit easier to ensure that all the other holes are lining up and we're able to do a nice clean install of the distoner section. And we're not going overboard on the torque for these. Uh, if you have a torque wrench, maybe 70 inch pounds is what you're looking for. Um, but really it's just, uh, you know, maybe finger tight plus a couple turns to get that lock washer uh, set in place. Um, there's not really, there's not a whole, whole lot of reason to go, go to town on this and I would highly recommend not um, using an impact wrench for this because that's just going to be total overkill. 70 inch pounds versus 1400. Uh, that can damage, damage some stuff. There's really no need for it. Now that you have your distoner contraption attached, uh, just nice and perfect, um, we're gonna go ahead and add this squared around uh, conversion tube. This is gonna be the last thing uh, that will be unique to you as a distoner uh, purchaser uh, until we get to the commissioning of the distoner itself, which is setting up the airflow. So go ahead. Tilt your hopper back onto the right direction, and you're going to use a classic 10 millimeter socket, if you can find yours, and remove the hardware uh, that's attached um, to that squared around converter so that you're able to uh, tighten it onto your hopper. Okay, now that we have that distoner installed, you're able to see that we've run into a little bit of a problem. Namely, the distoner here is resting on the ground, but our feet are not. So your first thing that you want to do here, and this goes back to having a little bit of a gap between your outlet and the final position of your hopper, um, we're going to tilt this back so you're easily able to get these feet so that uh, the uh, distoner hopper will be resting on the feet rather than on the distoner itself. Now you don't need to, uh, we're gonna be leveling this and getting it into its final configuration later. Um, so you just need to have the back feet uh, so that they are further down than the distoner. Um, you don't need to have it set perfectly in place at this point. So the Savda distoner lift comes with a uh, insert that stops um, some things from getting pulled into the lift system. Um, and at the bottom, when you get it out of the packaging, it's gonna have these protective sleeves on them. Uh, you can just go ahead and either cut them off. I just like to just pull them off because it's super easy. Um, and that exposes these rollers. These are magnetic. So what these are going to do is capture any of your ferrous metals. Um, some of the rocks, uh, you know, if, if you get a nail or something, it'll get stuck to that. A lot of rocks with high iron content, etc. Those are going to get stuck right onto these magnets here. The uh, rest of it is just designed to stop any large pieces, like a, if you have like a you know, a paper towel or something that falls in. If that got sucked up into the lift, it'd be just a, you know, it's not gonna hurt anything, but then you gotta pull the top off and pull the thing off. And so this just stops anything like that from happening. Um, and also, uh, uh, I guess, stops people from reaching down a little bit too far and maybe getting a finger caught in the gate or something like that. So we're uh, just gonna go ahead and drop it in place. If you look at our hopper here, we do have cutouts for these end pieces. And so you're gonna just drop it uh, just like that and now it's locked in place and it's not gonna move, slide around on you. So now that we have those feet dropped down so the distoner isn't dragging on the ground, we're able to put our hopper into more or less its final position. There'll be a little bit more fidgeting to do, um, but at least this is gonna give us a little bit of an idea on uh, how our track clamp run is gonna go. And, uh, at this point, whether you have a distoner hopper or a standard hopper, uh, this one might look a little bit different if you have a standard hopper, uh, but the final connections all the way up uh, to uh, termination and control, uh, everything with the exception of distoner commissioning specifically at the end of this video uh, is gonna apply to you, um, and it, it won't be any different between the two models. Now, when you were unpackaging your pieces that came with the lift, you may have noticed that some of the pieces of tri-clamp spool, uh, that's what this is, this is a spool of tri-clamp tubing, um, will have numbers on them. So this being number one, is uh, it's recommended that this goes on first. Uh, right butted up to your sight glass. So, in a little cardboard box and a nice uh, handy uh, green coffee sample bag, I suppose, uh, you have yourself a sight glass. Um, and you can pop off those end pieces. And I'll show you how the tri clamp uh, pieces work up close here. Tri clamp is a great technology. It really uh, makes um, our lives and your lives quite a bit easier. You're just going to put 
this ribbed gasket in, um, and that tends to kind of stay in place uh, because it does have uh, a milled out section that that gasket rests in, which is really nice. And then you can just set your spool on there, um, make sure that uh, the gasket is set in position and you don't have it pinched or offset at all um, because that can break the seal. So when you've got it lined up like that, you're simply going to put the tri-clamp around the fitting and just tighten it finger tight. That's really all it takes. This is not something that you need to jam down a ton. Um, if you do that, you actually could run the risk of uh, cutting that gasket a little bit. So, I mean, you can see here with a very loose clamping, we've got that, you know, uh, very nice and tight on there. I'll show you one more with the sight glass. We're gonna do the same thing. Put our gasket in place, set the sight glass on. One of the things that I like to do just for aesthetic purposes uh, when I'm doing installs is ensure that, first of all, the clamps are all facing the same way, and second of all, that they're lined up. You can uh, choose whether or not you care enough at this point to uh, do an install like that. And we're gonna go ahead and just uh, cut to a time lapse of the rest of the piping going up, and I'll finish off with uh, the termination and a couple of particulars about that. Now that you have your tri-clamp fittings installed, the next step is to line up the cyclone inlet where the beans enter the cyclone with the tri-clamp tubing that you have in place. I'm gonna take you through that, but the first step, uh, super easy, is just go ahead and remove your access panel. In order to save some time, I've prepped this by removing the other eight bolts, uh, nuts, excuse me. Um, but yeah, just go ahead and remove the, I guess it's seven total, uh, and uh, then you're able to just pop the screen right out and you've got access to the uh, butterfly valve and the tri-clamp that keeps it in place. Um, that's gonna make a little bit more sense in a moment, but you're gonna need to reach in here and adjust where this butterfly valve rests in order to twist the cyclone. I'm gonna go ahead and jump on the back of the machine and we're gonna film from the front here so that you can see what's going on nice and clear. Okay, I have a separate video on this particular process that we did from a test bench, and you'll be able to see it a little bit more clearly. If you're having difficulty after this video, uh, I can go ahead and link that in the video description here. Um, but basically, if you have an older model hopper, uh, you may have these nuts that I'm pointing at here w not welded in place, in which case you would need to get a 10 millimeter socket on that to stop the bolt from twisting the nut. In this case, and the majority of our, uh, our, our hoppers that we've sold, this nut is welded in place, but it's something to note, so we shouldn't have to worry about that. The next step to rotating the cyclone is just loosen these uh, nuts up here. They're 10 mil, or excuse me, bolts. They are 10 millimeter. Um, however, I really love uh, using my uh, player's wrenches for this. Um, you really need to either get an open-ended 10 millimeter uh, wrench or something like this to do these. Uh, you're not gonna be able to fit a socket on there just due to the uh, um, spacing between the cyclone and the bolt itself. Uh, so as I go through, um, I'm just gonna loosen all of these uh, until they're finger loose. You'd be able to remove them with your fingers, but I'm not actually gonna remove them. Um, and we can fast forward through the rest of these. So at this point, you've loosened all of the uh, bolts holding the cyclone on. The next thing you wanna do is go ahead and loosen the tri-clamp fitting that holds the uh, butterfly valve on. One thing to note, do not over loosen this uh, because this, this is what's holding the butterfly valve on. Butterfly valve is surprisingly heavy. If you go a little bit too far and allow this uh, clasp to slip out of the tri-clamp, what could happen is this butterfly valve will fall uh, and it's just kind of hard to get it put back on. It's unlikely to damage anything and there's, there's not really a whole, a whole lot of distance for it to fall, uh, but it's just really annoying to try and get it back on. So loosen it, basically the goal is to loosen it to the point where you can slide this butterfly valve independent of the cyclone and we're pretty close. Just give it a couple more. Yeah, I think that's gonna work for us. So our goal is to get this, this is the inlet. Right here, this is the vacuum connection. Uh, this is the bean inlet, and it's the one with the larger diameter. That's how you can know it, and it's also lower. Our goal is to get this pointed 
that direction right towards our uh, tri-clamp. And um, it's a pretty simple process to do it. What you're going to do is twist the tri-clamp. And then, excuse me, twist the cyclone. And then down in the bottom, twist the butterfly valve over when it makes contact with the mounting plate. And just repeat that process until the cyclone is pointed in the right direction. Um, this is something you could measure it or use a chalk line or something like that uh, if, you, if you, you're going up against a wall. For me, I really just like to eyeball it, just get in right in line with it and see, uh, see where you're pointed off to. So I'm content with that um, right there, how it is. The orientation of the butterfly valve itself doesn't matter. I do recommend uh, moving it enough so that it's not contacting this mounting plate. However, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter if it's off uh, you know, a few degrees towards you or away from you. Uh, don't worry too much about that. Um, I am a little bit, I like everything to be just so on the installs, so I make sure that it's lined up at a perfect uh, 90, but that doesn't have any operational benefit. Um, and so now we're gonna go ahead, just tighten that tri-clamp in so that it's not gonna move on you, um, and you can go ahead and tighten all of these uh, fasteners up top. Now that we have our cyclone adjusted and in line with the tri-clamp conveyance, um, we're gonna go ahead and put together our decelerator tube. Uh, the decelerator tube is your three inch or 76 millimeter section of spool, of tri-clamp spool. Um, and uh, we'll have sent with you whatever is needed for your particular run. Uh, what the decelerator tool do, uh, uh, piece does is it expands out the volume of air from two inches up to three inches or from 51 up to 76 millimeters. Um, and that spreading out of the air uh, slows down the coffee. So basically it's going from the two inch to the three inch that slows down the coffee um, because there's, there's the same amount of air in more space um, so that it's not hitting quite as hard. In this case, I believe we've got a 300 millimeter uh, spool. You may occasionally have more than 300 millimeters, uh, just depending on the length of the run. The longer the run, the faster the coffee gets, um, the more decelerator space it needs. So uh, just like all the other tri-clamp, you're gonna take your three inch, you're gonna attach the three inch to two inch reduction piece, and you're gonna go ahead and clamp it in place. Um, and then the two inch piece is gonna attach to the tri-clamp that you placed on the hopper and the three inch is going to attach to the cyclone itself. Now that we've put together our decelerator tube, we're able to attach the decelerator right onto the cyclone. It'll be the same process as always. Uh, this time it does get a little bit more complicated on the tri-clamp uh, tubing because you need to line it up vertically. Uh, but as you saw there, I just kept it in place um, and we're, we were able to get that uh, in the right position relatively easily there. One of the other things, if you're working two-handed, um, you can just grab it, hold on to the decelerator tube, it's not gonna fall, uh, and you can go ahead and tighten that fitting. So as you can see here, we have a little bit of uh, a space difference. Um, our precision fill is a little bit too short or our hopper is a little bit too high. Uh, what I would recommend you do at this point is go ahead and either raise the feet on the equipment that you're installing or lower the feet on the hopper itself. Uh, but on occasion, there are times when you can't do that. So um, I'm gonna show you a little bit of a workaround, something that I consider to be just a twitch easier. Uh, instead of trying to get it up and down matched this way, I personally find it to be a little bit easier to go ahead and attach your elbow directly to the decelerator. Uh, and then we can go down a little bit lower and we're working with something that's uh, in the same plane but just left or right rather than trying to fidget with the up and down movement as well. We want everything to just be uh, as easy as possible. So we're going to leave that with a little bit of flex to it and then we're going to uh, uh, back off and I'll show you how to do it from a little bit lower. In changing the orientation from having to work on it horizontally to working on it vertically, uh, we've just made our life a little bit easier. So I'm gonna be able to now just pop this in 
and get these clamps lined up quite a bit easier than trying to work up high there. Um, it's still, uh, you might need to, let me turn this around so you can see it. You may uh, need to put the clamp on and actually use the clamp to pull the two pieces of uh, piping together. Um, so I don't know if you can get in right here and see how it's not fully around uh, that link there. Um, but it is uh, a, an option that you've got in a little bit of a tight spot if you're really close and needing to make it work. Um, just putting that tri-clamp on and tightening it down is going to uh, pull everything into line for you. Um, and it'll still seal just fine. There we go. Now we have a fully connected hopper and cyclone. Uh, our next step is going to be to hook up the vacuum. Okay, now that we have all of our tri-clamp uh, fittings connected together, as they should be for the install, we're able to go ahead and mount our vacuum. There are a number of different options for the vacuum mount, and that's going to depend on your installation and your workflow. Uh, many people like to mount the vacuum onto the machine, usually on uh, one of the sides here, um, where you can still remove the vacuum to access the panels, making sure that you're not blocking that out. What we've opted to do in our space is go ahead and mount, uh, with some masonry bits, our vacuum hanger onto the wall here. So I'm going to go ahead and show you very easily just how these uh, vacuums uh, slot in. You're going to want to get the bottom piece lined up, top one lined up, and you can just hang it right on the wall. Uh, and now that our vacuum is mounted, uh, we can go ahead, run the electrical and plug it in, and connect our vacuum hose from the vacuum up to the cyclone. Okay, now that our vacuum is mounted, we get to go ahead and uh, prepare the vacuum hose. This is what we call adjusting the slit in some of our documents. Um, and what this is going to do is control the max conveyance speed of your coffee whether you have a distoner lift or a standard lift. Um, if you find that your coffee is conveying a little bit too fast or too slow, later on you can come back to this step and adjust where the slit is. What I'm going to give you is a good midpoint that works for the majority of installations. However, uh, if you want to be a little bit more particular with this step, do some conveyance testing and readjust, that's completely fine. Uh, the first thing that you're going to take is your 90 degree tri-clamp elbow. And we're just going to go ahead and attach that to the weld end with uh, the hole cut in it there. Um, you should have only received one weld end, and this is what we'll attach to the hose. Uh, just like all of our tri-clamps, we're going to go ahead and attach those two pieces together. And I like to do it with two pieces before getting into the hose connection, uh, just because it gives you a little bit more to grab onto, um, and you, you just can get a little bit better grip when you're sliding this into the hose. So now that we've got those two pieces put together, I'm going to grab one of the ends of our hose here and just get it into a good position to uh, be able to slide. You'll see here I've got a little bit of water. This is just to ease the insertion of this piece into our uh, hose here. So I'm just going to take a little bit and wipe it around on the inside. Um, and then just go ahead and work in this weld end piece so that just over half of this hole here is open. So we're looking for about a third of it there, maybe a little bit more than a third of it to be open, and that's going to adjust your max capacity. So this is where the 7 millimeter uh, socket that I mentioned at the beginning of the video comes in. You can use a uh, Phillips or a flathead screwdriver, but the 7 millimeter socket makes this way easier. We're just going to go ahead, slide our tri-clamp into place, and tighten it in. I do like to put a decent amount of torque on this. Um, first of all, it's not going to hurt anything. Uh, it's just pushing against the rubber and the stainless piece, which is really strong in a, in a circular fashion like that. Second of all, there is a fair amount of vibration and twisting. Basically, the hose is just hanging off of here. So if you don't get it nice and tight, uh, this could, over time, work itself off of this, which is going to do two things. One, eventually your hose could just fall off. Uh, but two, it's going to mess up the uh, amount of space that you have available for your slit here. So if that works down, it's going to increase that size and decrease your suction. Um, again, when you have this installed, if you want to try and slide this hose back and forth a little bit more to see uh, if there's a better setting for you, by all means go for it. But this is, this is where I like to start, and this is going to be okay for 90% of the installs.
Now we can go ahead and hook this onto the cyclone. And just like all of our other tri-clamp attachments, we're gonna put the gasket in there, we're gonna put our hose on there, and we're gonna lock this puppy in place. Okay, now your uh, vacuum hose is attached to your cyclone. We're back to the trusty seven millimeter with our second uh, hose clamp here, and we're going to attach the hose onto the vacuum. And now your hose is attached to your vacuum. At Sovda, we've shipped out two types of control boxes. One has a uh, closing mechanism and hinge. The second, with the controller mounted in the, in the uh, front plate here, um, is just held on with these screws. So uh, regardless of the type of control box that you have, what you wanna do is just go ahead and um, remove the uh, lid from the control box. Uh, and that might just mean that you're opening a door rather than actually removing everything. Um, there are some wires attached here, so it's important to uh, remember that. Uh, and since I have this open, I'm just gonna take a moment to go, to go over. Here we have a uh, contactor for the vacuum control. We have uh, some circuit protection, an inverter, our PLC that controls uh, the cycles, um, and all of the wiring that connects to that. If you move down to the bottom of the control box here, we have a number of connection points um, for electrical, for the vacuum control and for the uh, um, butterfly valve that drops the coffee up top. Those are the basics of the control box. And if you take a look on the back side of the box, you'll notice that there are some pre-drilled mounting points um, on this box. These pre-drilled mounting points will correspond with mounting points on any of your Savdi equipment, be it a Precision Full or a Pearl Mini. Those are preset for you and already tapped, make it very easy to attach. Um, if you'd like to attach this to something else, we've also used leg bolts as anchors or self-tapping uh, sheet metal screws. Um, it's a fairly light box and uh, there's not a whole lot of torsion on it, so you do have a number of mounting options for the box. And now I'm gonna take it over to the precision fill and show you how to mount it. So I've got the box here with the screen off and I'm just going to push the hardware right through that hole there and start it by hand. And then once I know that it's set in place, I'm just going to still support that uh, box there and come in with uh, whatever type of bit you need to tighten the uh, hardware in place. And when I finally torque the hardware, I'm just making sure that both holes, uh, the other hole lines up quite well with uh, the point that we're mounting that. Okay, now that we have our first piece of hardware in place and we have uh, the second, second hole kind of lined up there, um, we're gonna go ahead, stick the hardware through. Like so. And get it right into the hole there. Again, starting it by finger. And finishing it off with a little bit of power. And that's how you mount the sub to control box. Now it's time to connect the cables to the uh, control box and the various equipment that it operates. Uh, you should have two or three individual cables. In this case, we only have two cables because the cable that controls the uh, butterfly valve has already been installed uh, from the factory. So we don't need to run that one up to the top. We can just plug it in uh, right to the control box. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and just separate out the two cables we've got. Obviously we have a power cable here which is indicated by the fact that it goes into a wall outlet. And then this one is going to be our uh, vacuum control cable. And we know that because the vacuum control cable is just uh, two wires. Um, and the uh, only other two wire cable would be for the butterfly valve and that one's already connected. So we're gonna go ahead, oh, it also is labeled vacuum. Nice little uh, benefit from the uh, factory as well. So in order to attach the vacuum wire, 
we're going to take this cannon plug, pull off the uh, vacuum cannon plug cover, slide this in, and tighten our cannon plug connection. With the other end here, we're going to take these two wires and walk over to our vacuum. Depending on the run that you have, you may have a slightly different vacuum model, uh, but all of the vacuum uh, control inlets are going to look like this. Some of them are labeled, some of them are not. It does not matter which one goes where. All you're going to do is straighten out the wire, put it in place. Beautiful. Now your vacuum's connected. Our next one's super easy. The factory's already connected the butterfly valve to the solenoid that controls it. Uh, so all we have to do is come down here, just like we did with the vacuum, put the uh, cannon plug in place and tighten it down. Finally, we get to run the power cord, which simply slides into place after removing the uh, dust cover. And we can plug it in here. Go ahead, make sure that your vacuum is plugged in and your control box is plugged in. And we can see that we have power here. Um, in order for the lift to run, you do need it to uh, have air pressure as well. Um, but I'm just gonna show you the actuation cycle. You can see when the outlet is open, we have a blue light on. Uh, when it's shut and the uh, vacuum is going up, we're gonna have, a, I believe it's a green light. And that's what it'll be to uh, operate the lift. Congratulations, now that you have your control box hooked up, wired uh, with power to both the butterfly valve and to the vacuum, your vacuum is plugged in, you have air pressure going to the machine, you're ready to do some uh, lifting of coffee. Regardless of which model you have, if you have a distoner model, I like to just make sure it's conveying properly before messing around with anything. We're gonna get into the commissioning on that, I promise, that's gonna be our next section. Uh, but at this point, we're just ready to see if it lifts. Now for all of you who have a standard lift, um, the, really the last thing that you have to do is just check the conveyance speed. Um, and that's gonna be that slit adjustment that we did before. We recommend uh, no more than 10 kilos per cycle on, uh, on the lift system. Uh, otherwise you do get into some excessive bean breakage. Um, but ultimately it really only needs to be as fast as your roaster uh, or whatever your slowest uh, portion of your pipeline is. Um, and the slower it's gonna convey, uh, the less bean breakage you'll get. At 10 kilos, we're looking at uh, maybe a 2 to 3% uh, bean breakage when it's going from uh, a piece of machinery into the lift, into the piece of another piece of machinery, and then bagged. So that isn't uh, just the lift alone. Um, that's all, all of the steps, including the lift, uh, that you're getting a little bit of breakage. So basically, the solution is if you find that you're getting broken beans in your coffee, increase the size of that slit. That's gonna reduce your conveyance speed and uh, reduce the speed of the coffee entering the hopper where the damage happens. For those of you who have a distoner lift, you're not quite done. We still need to do a little bit of commissioning and calibration on the lift, uh, distoner portion of the lift. Now, your distoner uh, may look a little bit different. We have a number of different distoner chambers that are attached. Um, sometimes we have the sight glass on the side here. Sometimes we have it on the front. Sometimes there isn't a sight glass at all. Um, occasionally the distoner chamber is gonna be a little bit wider as well. Um, and all of that plays a role in uh, the distoner uh, operations. So uh, what I like to do first is just check our conveyance speed as we just did with the gate fully open. Um, and we know we've got uh, the ability to lift. There's nothing wrong in any of the other uh, systems that are operating the lift. Uh, we can see that coffee is indeed uh, getting conveyed into our precision fill here with the, the site class equipped on that precision fill. Uh, so we are good to go to start doing a little bit of distoner adjusting. 
Uh, there's two things that I, li I like to go over really quick on entering into setting up your distoner. The first thing is if you have stones that you've personally pulled out of coffee that you've done before, or maybe you had a smaller distoner um, and you've been collecting these stones, those are the types of stones that uh, we really like to test with because first of all, they're real use case stones for what's gonna be in the coffee. Um, and uh, second of all, they're usually readily available in a roastery environment. Uh, so I have a little collection of those, and I'm just going to count out eight of those of uh, various sizes and materials and toss them in uh, and just literally run it through completely as is to see how many of those stones we're catching without making any changes at all. Okay, so these are the stones that I've selected for uh, the testing. Um, I guess I did go off book a little bit here. I just grabbed a couple. We've got two non-stone items. So this is just a sour coffee cherry, um, unroasted. And, you know, on occasion, I guess, a, a green coffee bean could get into uh, your roasted by, uh, you know, human error or whatever. We do have a little washer here. Um, those are things that occasionally might, might fall into your roaster. Maybe something's falling off the front of your roaster into the cooling tray. That happens pretty frequently. So we want to see, this is also stainless steel. So we know it's not going to get stuck onto the, uh, the metal, the magnets um, in the catch tray. So this is actually going to get sent through and we'll see if we can remove that. Uh, we have a couple other, this is a low density small rock and then a high density small rock. So we're making sure we're getting both of those. Nice big beefy guy that, you know, frankly, we're not going to have a problem with that at all. Um, and then we do have a nice piece of patio, which is the most common that you're going to find. Um, in your coffee, and then uh, just a really kind of jagged, super light density uh, piece of rock here, almost like a sandstone. Um, and then this is just kind of a more of a common pebble. So yeah, uh, this gives us a good idea of uh, the dynamic range of our distoner. Um, and you might have a situation where, man, we're really getting the small, you know, uh, high density piece, but some of the larger low density pieces aren't working out. Uh, you're gonna be able to see that before you are you know, testing with actual coffee that's going into actual grinders um, and make sure that you've got all, all your bases covered. Now that we've conveyed everything through, first thing we're gonna do is remove our uh, stone catch tray. And I guess it's not a stainless piece. We must have a standard washer here. Interesting. Um, so you can see we caught not only the washer with the magnets, but also um, a ferrous piece of metal, uh, which I think is what I was calling the common pebble there. So both of those uh, got attracted to the magnet. Um, and it uh, doesn't look like we got any of the other six here. So now you get to pull out the uh, stone catch tray, which is right here down on the bottom. And that's just going to slide right off, maybe. So we can see a couple things here. First of all, um, we have a lot of coffee left over, and that's a problem. This is more coffee than you should have left over in the, in the bean tray. Uh, let's walk over to a table and see if we caught any of the other rocks. So we're just going to go ahead, dump these out on a table, and see what else we caught. You know, there's a washer there. That's fascinating. Um, I'm pretty sure the other one uh, was the one I put in there, but we got another washer. do have one large rock, and I think I saw our partial sour... There's a green bean, not the one that I put in. So yeah, basically it looks like we got a little bit of work to do. We got a lot of coffee left over um, and we only got four of our eight uh, defects that we, we put into the, into the uh, distoner. So now I'm gonna show you how to really bring that in, calibrate it and uh, make sure that you don't have those problems with your distoner. Okay, we've got all the original rocks in there. And uh, um, what I like to do personally is start by lowering your front gate. Uh, from your first run, you've got it all the way up in its uh, fully upright position. Just for fun here, we're gonna go ahead and move this down just to about, let's say halfway there. Um, and what that's gonna do is restrict the amount of beans coming in and realistically restrict the velocity of the beans entering the chamber. So it's gonna make, um, instead of the beans kind of flowing in, hitting the wall and going up, this is gonna kind of just evenly let them fall onto 
the destoner tray and then get lifted. Um, that's kind of the action of lowering that gate. It's also changing uh, the total amount of volume of beans dispersed through the air um, and restricting a little bit of the airflow as well, which uh, just changes the uh, density dynamics in this uh, site class. Um, the site class is an interesting way to see uh, if you need to speed up or slow down your lifting. So during this one, as we lift it, what we're looking for is just a nice kind of slow, steady, uh, you know, kind of a waterfall effect of the beans just moving up somewhat slowly. Um, you know, if you're seeing them uh, up here, they should look like they're going quite a bit faster than they are in the distoner window there. Uh, so if you see that it looks like it's about the same speed, you're definitely conveying too quickly and you need to shut this gate. We'll talk about our air lift gate in a moment here. Um, we're calling that the air lifter and uh, uh, some of the tweaking that you do with that. But for this point, let's just go ahead and see how it conveys with our gate, our inside gate, our bean gate at, uh, at half, half depth here. Okay, and you can see this is definitely a higher velocity here than what you're seeing in this gate, in this window. But I think that this is probably still a little too fast. So I'm gonna come in and just bring that gate down. And it looks like that right there is about our sweet spot for the, uh, for the beam gate. One of the questions we often get asked is why does the lift run on a cycle? Um, and that's a great question. So in order for there to be enough suction coming through this tube to actually lift the coffee, the cyclone up top, that butterfly valve needs to be closed, which means that the vacuum is pulling all the coffee up into the cyclone, but it can't drop it with the vacuum running. Uh, what the, the cycle allow allows is the cyclone itself, once it gets full, um, it gives it some time for that butterfly valve to open and all that coffee to flow out of the cyclone into whatever equipment you're trying to load with it. Um, then once it, that time uh, has elapsed, it closes that valve and it starts sucking coffee again. Now that we've made a little bit of an adjustment to our gate there, we can take a look. We've got both of our washers again. Uh, one of the washers, and then um, two of our ferrous pieces of, of metal. Um, so I'm going to put those off to the side here, put this back in place, and let's take a look at our coffee retention and what we caught in the distoner tray. Now this is already looking much more promising. Uh, you can tell right off the bat we've got a lot more rocks in here. This is the washer that I just dropped in there. Um, uh, but point being, there's a lot more rocks and a lot less coffee. Uh, we still have a little bit of work to do, but um, we're getting closer. Okay, at this point, all we've really done was eyeball the bean gate um, to uh, kind of get the flow to where it was as low as possible without stalling out. Um, and that did pretty well for us. We got six out of our eight obstructions. Uh, you can tell we're still missing um, our sour bean and one of the rocks. Uh, so. The next step, now that you're kind of in the zone where you know, yeah, we're, we're getting pretty dialed here. We've got six out of the eight stones and not a whole lot of beans left over. Now you can start messing with what we're calling the air riser. And that is this piece right up here in front of the machine. It might look a little different depending on the machine that you've got. Um, but basically, you're just going to loosen the nuts up top so that they provide a little friction um, but aren't tight on it. And then go ahead, loosen that finger nut, and you're able to just slide this up. Uh, so we've got these lines of holes here, and what that lets you do is increase the airflow here, um, which decreases the density even a little bit more down here. Uh, so the beans can still come up, flow through, and then they get uh, kind of a little burst of air here to keep them going, but anything heavier uh, is actually in a lower density space down in this bottom, and it's more likely to stay down. So what we recommend doing is just try it a half row at a time until you uh, get your best results. And if you start finding that, wow, hey, uh, you know, I'm doing this and now it's getting worse, well, you've hit the sweet spot and you should start working back. Okay, now that we've gone ahead and run the test with just a half row open, we're gonna go ahead and take a look at the results. Once again, we're starting, looks like we only got the washer this time on our magnet. 
Oh, one thing to note with the magnets, when you do have a heavier rock that's attached to it, sometimes when you lift this up, it'll be on the bottom, and as you spin it over that rock, will just slide around to the other side. So it can be beneficial to, if you're, you know, you find a situation like that, you just lift it from this position, and then just look at it at the bottom, and then you're able to see everything that's been stuck to it. So this time we just got the washer, so let's take a look to see what we caught. This is, uh, looks like we're, we're still improving here. So we got quite a few less beans. Let's, let's go over to a table and analyze. Okay, so we've got uh, less beans again. So, okay, one thing I, I wanted to mention, this is our test coffee. So this is basically just garbage coffee we keep on running through. So all these little broken bits, um, you're not gonna get this level of breakage just from the lift conveyance. This is what happens if you do it, you know, a thousand times to the coffee. Uh, so let's go through here. We've got, looks like four of the rocks, not the original sour that we found, but a couple little uh, um, baby sours. And, uh, okay, so we're, we're, we're getting closer there. We got, we got five of them and less beans. So let's go ahead and move that gate up just a little bit more and see if we get a better result. So we're gonna move this from a half row of holes open to a full row of holes open. And then go ahead and tighten it down. Okay, so based off of uh, what I'm seeing in the, the uh, distoner screen, um, with a nice, consistent, kind of slow, increasing speed upwards, um, I'm feeling pretty good about where we're set here with uh, the gate. Uh, basically, where we are is, in this particular one, it looks like about a third of the way up, and one air hole row available. So. As you can see, we do have uh, a little bit of coffee left, um, but not a ton, and it looks like quite a bit on the rock. So let's head over to the table and see what we got. So on this particular one, we actually didn't have any stuck to the magnets, um, which has happened in the past. But we got our initial sour there. Here, two, four, six, eight, and nine. So we may have found an actual uh, natural rock in there. Um, so that's pretty cool. So now, basically, it's up to you to decide what's more important for you. For me, um, having really good, consistent results with the rocks, um, and for us, I guess it's not we use this coffee for testing all the time, so it's uh, more, a little bit more common for us to find a rock just in there and having all that broken material. Uh, that's something that you're probably not gonna have to deal with at your uh, roastery. I do recommend that you don't use a coffee that you plan to sell for this process because you are gonna send it through a couple times and you might wind up with some, some breakage. Uh, but going back to the point on, you, you have a balance between the number of rocks left over um, and the number of beans left over. And generally speaking, the less beans left over, the less rocks you're gonna have left over as well. Um, so it's kind of up to you to dial in. For us, where we are with our equipment, we're satisfied with this, um, these, this number of beans uh, left just for a quick uh, installation. Uh, but you can get it dialed. Uh, usually what we're looking for is all of the rocks retained and less than 10 beans remaining in that rock catcher. Um, so with a little bit more tweaking, depending on the coffee that you have, uh, if it's a dark roast, light roast, high altitude, low altitude, whatever it might be, Pacamaras are gonna be a little bit different. Uh, you're just gonna have to tweak that gate a little bit for each of your different coffees to get it dialed in exactly where you want it to be. Um, but uh, yeah, that's uh, how you commission and uh, uh, calibrate your distoner for the installation. Thanks for joining me on this Uncrate and Assembly how-to video. If you have any further questions, please contact your technical ambassador or find us at our website, savdacoffee.com.